Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk about Bolgard 3 per se, but I'll be talking about some of the issues around the different toxins in, that are going into Bolgard 3 um, and the recent development of Omidra ending up in, uh, in the new world. So most of you probably don't need much introduction, so I'll keep that brief. I'll talk about the different types of BT resistance that we see to the three different toxins that are going to go into Bolgard 3. Um, spend some time talking about the implications of Omidra in the new world. Um, and a little bit about what we're doing at CSRO and the future of, of some of the research. So uh, I, I can quickly skip this slide probably. CSRO does a, has a long history with Helicoverpa across all sorts of different um, uh, research disciplines, lots of R&D going on in terms of the biology and ecology, um, modeling, resistance management, resistance mechanisms, um, lots of other things, a long history of looking at Armidra in particular, but also Punctidra. And I don't need to tell you that the problems it can cause, if not controlled, this is why we have um, GM, or at least BT, cotton. But it's important to remember in a global context that cotton is a relatively small player in terms of the hosts um, available to Armidra. It's one of the most polyphagous uh, species out there. It, it will eat uh, many, many different species. There's uh, pictures from Brazil of it punching holes in oranges and quite happily chewing on, a, on, a, on citrus. So BT resistance. So, you know, the first off is that Australia is held up around the world uh, as an example of successful resistance management. Uh, this paper was, came out a few years ago and they, they started to look at where problems had started to develop in various species in various different types of um, uh, um, BT crops. And what you want to see is lots of nice blue and green, and which is what we have here in Australia. And there's starting to be issues. These would be, certainly in China would be Armidra. Um, and other places around the world. Um, particularly in the US, they're starting to have some issues, but in Australia so far, we have no problems with um, um, uh, failure in the field. So the current BT resistance status out there in, in, the, in the big wide world, um, I stole this from uh, the data from Sharon Downs and pretty much the slide directly from uh, Ian Taylor. Um, Cry1AC resistance that we can find out in the field is still very rare. It's about one in 2,000 moths will carry a, a version of the gene which will make them resistant to Cry1AC um, in both species, Punctigera and Armidura. Cry2AB is really quite a high percentage. Uh, one in 15 individual insects will be carrying something that will um, make them resistant, uh, in, a, in a homozygous individual at least, make them resistant to um, uh, Cry2AB. And that again is in both species. So VIP3A is the next um, BT that's going to end up in, in Bolgard 3. And we can see that already, or already uh, as a background level, there's a relatively high resistance allele frequency out there in the population. One in 20 moths will carry a resistance allele in, for Armidra and a one in 50 in Punctidra. These numbers would be, for, particularly for Cry2AB and VIP3A, very scary in a single gene product. Um, but the, the important thing, of course, about uh, the new lines that are coming out is that they're stacked. And so there should be all of these toxins present. <coughs> so uh, Cry1AC resistance, or resistant alleles. Uh, Cry1AC appeared in the Australian landscape in 96, uh, and it's still at a very low allele frequency. There are a whole pile of different mechanisms. Now, I won't go too much into the genetics and molecular biology of, of this, but I will do that a bit tomorrow at REFCOM. Uh, but just briefly, that up there, these are representations of genes, all the same gene, the cadherin gene in Armidra. Uh, this is what a normal gene looks like, and then you can have a variety of interruptions and disruptions in this gene, which would make any individual carrying two copies of this gene resistant to Cry1AC. So there's a wide variety, as you can see, and there's at least seven more, uh, including um, a dominant allele from China, which, is, which gets to be sort of a bit more scary. The vast majority of alleles we see out there are recessive, meaning you have to have two copies of the gene to be resistant. Um, most of these have been isolated from China and India. Uh, we've looked in Australia at, at, at the small number of BT uh, survivors, and we don't see any evidence of this mutation in Armidra in Australia. But we do see a very similar type of mutation in the low-frequency Cry1AC 
uh, resistant individuals that we find in punctigera. So that's a disruption at, at this locus here, which means that you don't have a functional gene, which means you have a resistant individual. So these resistances are out there, and they're similar in, in type to what is found uh, around the rest of the world. So of these resistances, of the red and orange dots, a lot of them are uh, cry one type resistances. So they're resistances to cry one type proteins. Um, and that's probably because they've been out in the environment a long, much longer, but also in a lot of the rest of the world, there may be a single gene uh, in a product. Uh, le less and less so now, but in the past, that would have been the case. <coughs> so cry 2 ab resistance um, introduced with 1AC in 2004 and now the vast majority of the crop in Australia is, is Volgard 2. Um, it's a relatively high fr frequency resistance allele. If this was out there in the population as a single gene and we were bringing out a single gene cry 2 ab you wouldn't expect the, 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 you wouldn't expect the toxin to work for very long. You'd get resistance developing very quickly. Again, or, or in this case, uh, we looked, um, and this is um, work done by by Sharon, I think, uh, and, and Rod Mann, we looked before the release of CRY2AB and we were able to find resistance alleles out in the population. Resistance allele frequency did a bit of a spike a couple of years ago, which got a little bit worrying for a while, but it uh, it's now seems to have stabilized. Um, it's recessive, so again, you, that means you need two copies of the gene to be resistant, and we can't see any fitness costs associated with this resistance. If you have this resistance, you seem to be just as capable of surviving as, as ones that don't. Now, there's some evidence of resistance in Asia from lab-selected lines, but no, nobody is, ever, is really properly looking for CRY2AB resistance out in the field in the way that we do here. And we've, got, we've identified the mechanism, and this will be published in the very near future and is going to be presented at a conference in the States um, next month, I think, so I can't really say too much about it. But uh, um, So VIP3A, resistance characteristics. This is going into Bolgard 3. Again, a relatively high resistance allele frequency. Again, before the release of the toxin. Um, as far as we know so far, the characteristics, it's recessive in punctigera. Armidura, it's not quite as clear. There may be some uh, slight dominance there. Uh, it's a single gene as far as we know, and there are certainly some fitness costs in punctigera. If you look at this graph here, you've got the frequency of resistance and generation time along here. And what we did was we set them off in the lab <coughs> at a known frequency uh, of resistant alleles, and we watched what happens to the, the resistant individuals as we went along. So as I mentioned, CRY2AB, no fitness cost. It didn't drop at all, but VIP3A drops away over the generation times, suggesting there's a cost to being resistant to VIP3A. No evidence of resistance overseas um, in Armidura, and nobody's really properly looking, I think. And again, we have a, a, a good candidate for the gene uh, in Armidura in this case um, for this uh, resistance. So that's all the, the resistances individually, but in a stacked product, what's important is, you know, can you be multiply resistant? Is it even possible for all these different resistances to stack up in a, in a moth? So it turns out it is. Um, these are all um, lines except for this armidura line here that were isolated originally from the field um, through Sharon's monitoring project uh, funded by the CRDC. And so we've got CRY1AC uh, from the field for punctigera, CRY2AB from the field for our punctigera and armidura, and VIP3A from the field um, for, for both as well. You can put these together uh, as CRY2AB and VIP3A. And you can also make a triple resistant punctigera um, by combining all of them in the lab. Um, they all survive at a discriminating dose higher than you'd, you'd see in the plant. And the single genes have been tested on, on cotton. So we know that they will survive in, in, on, on cotton expressing the gene that they're supposed to be resistant to. Um, we don't know much about how well or, or how, um, how, the, how these multiply resistant individuals will do. Um, out in the field, it would be nice to do some, some work on multiple resistance to see, because that really is the only threat to a stacked gene product, how likely it is that it's really going to cause a problem. So I'll, uh, now moving on to Omidra in the new world and why this might, might be relevant, really. So this is pretty much the, di whoops, pretty much the distribution of Omidra 
Uh, it's across most of the old world. Uh, these are just record, re recorded collections. Obviously, it's spread much further than that. Um, and in about 2011, possibly 2010, uh, it was recorded in Brazil. And there were lots of headlines about states of emergency, and uh, for mostly so they could register new chemicals. Um, they were spraying every four days. It was figures quoted in various places of billions of dollars of cost um, for, for our major now in Brazil. Uh, they have lots of different BT crops here. The BT environment's very different to the one we have here, um, especially corn and soybean now for cryo ac And the big question, of course, was where will it go um, uh, in the rest of the new world? So the arrival of Armidura raises a, a number of different questions. Where did it come from? Because that has implications for um, what it might have brought with it, and what has it arrived with. Where will it go uh, in the new world? What impact will it have, and how will they manage that impact over there? So previous work has always shown that Armidura is one big population across this range. We're using a variety of different uh, markers. It we can't really separate it out into different populations, which is relatively unusual for something that covers this sort of scale. Uh, probably because it can migrate huge, large distances, uh, wide native host range, wide agricultural host range, and wide climatic range. But there is a similar species in the New World, Helicoverpa zaea, which is the closest related species to Helicoverpa armigera. Is that a wave? Okay. Um, so fortunately, we have some really good collections of armigera from around the world, uh, and including Brazil. There's a few gaps in that map, but we would like to... We'd like to fill those in. And the question was, until recently, would it get to the US? Turns out it's arrived in Florida. At least one has. They caught it in a trap um, uh, just uh, um, about a month ago. So in order to get to that um, question about where did it come from, one of the things we've done, and that we've done a, a bunch of different things, or just this is a nice clear example, is we've look, done something called genotyping by sequencing, which is where you look at thousands of markers across the genome. We can divide, when you, when you sort of plot the data like this, you can divide it into three groups quite easily. That's Helicoverpa zaea up there. We can separate Armidura and zaea, which is good. That's Australian Armidura, and that's Armidura in the rest of the world. And all these little purple upside down triangles are from Brazil. So we can pretty confidently say it wasn't us. It didn't come from here. Important to say, I think. <coughs> so this is a predicted distribution using um, climate suitability and irrigation patterns for where Armidura will go in the new world and, and where it is in the old world. And it's pretty clear you can just copy across the, the, the latitude for where, where it is in the old world to where it will go in the new world. Um, and then e even sort of seasonally, it'll go all the way up into Canada. If you overlay things like the, um, the corn belt sitting right around here, you've got a massive... Uh, You've got a very dark, a darkish color there, meaning those conditions will be very good for Armidura and sort of the cotton belt swinging down here as well, of course. So what are the implications and how does this, you know, ran, in a roundabout way relate back to uh, Bolgard 3? You've got this enormous increase in selection pressure. BT corn is a vast area of the US. In some cases, they're still single gene uh, uh, varieties. Often they're, they're, they're stacks, but often different stacks, lots of multiple events. Uh, and soybean as well now is becoming uh, cry when I see at least soybean. BT cotton is a relatively small player um, in terms of scale. Conventional pesticides, certainly in Brazil, they're spraying the new chemistries um, like crazy to control it, and they have to control cotton boll weevil down there, so they have to use the hard um, sprays, uh, and so IPM just goes out the window. And in some places, there's not much uh, resistance management. Um, and we have all sorts of questions around hybridization with Zaya um, and uh, ecological effects and, and also horticultural crops. The big question um, is really, will current management for Zaya work for Armidura? How similar are they? So just briefly, this is sort of a, a map of trade routes. We've got global crops, often this, even the same varieties around the world. We, we control them all the same way and we've got global trade, so it's not surprising we've got global pests. Um, and the question really is, 
are we going to end up with global resistances? And at CSRO, we're now thinking a lot about not just new species coming into the country, but new genotypes. And there's a few examples where new genotypes for resistance genes have come in, and things like aphids, and have caused big problems. <coughs> Uh, so just briefly, I'll, I'll skip really to molecular testing. We're, we're doing a lot of different things at, at CSIRO. And I mean, I, this is what I think you want to know for any insect you find on a crop. And maybe there's other things you want to add. What is it, first of all? And we can, we're using species-specific markers um, to look for Armidia and, and Zaya, and also the hybrids, of course. Where it came from, and we're using population-specific markers, one of the aphid species that we, we think is invaded, we think came from Europe. Um, is it resistant? And we, we're looking at red-legged earth mites, um, and we're getting samples direct from growers and able to tell them what the percentage of resistance alleles is in their population, which informs them for what, they, what things they might want to use next season. And again, uh, and the other thing you might want to know is what diseases is it carrying? Um, we can now look quite simply for viruses, bacteria, any of the pathogens, and we're doing this already for honeybees um, as part of a biosecurity project. So uh, molecular methods for a variety of research questions are not a research tool anymore. Um, they're also a practical tool in the field. So to conclude, Bt resistance is out there. There's, we're doing very well here. We don't have a problem here at the moment. But Bt resistance is out there. Selection pressure is going to be different going into the future on a global scale. We know that multiple resistance is possible. There are unknown consequences of Armidura in the, new, in the Americas. We don't know what will happen there. Is it different to Zaya is the big question probably for, for the managers there. And molecular methods have the potential to address many of these questions.